It's great to see all of you here. I am Amy Gutman. I'm a friend, a colleague, a collaborator, and an extravagant admirer of Dennis Thompson. Uh, one of the many extravagant admirers of Dennis Thompson, judging from this conference and the attendance here today. Um, let me just briefly say a few words of personal and professional appreciation of Dennis and then introduce, segue into introducing this panel entitled An Honorable Profession. Um, so uh, I met Dennis before uh, office or responsibility was as essentially tied to his character um, as it is today. It was actually not far from here on the banks of the Charles 40 years ago. Um, and Dennis and one Michael Doyle used to have lunch on the banks of the Charles. I had never met either of them. And in what turned out to be a fortuitous stroll down the Charles, I stopped. Uh, there was somebody I knew in this small group of intellectuals chatting away over lunch, which I subsequently found out Carol Thompson helped supply. <laughs> and um, it turned out uh, that was a very fortuitous meeting. Uh, Dennis and I were, since then, for 20 years, uh, not immediately after that, but for decades, um, co-authors and uh, co-teachers. Uh, and Michael Doyle's here today to eyewitness that account. Um, honor is a capacious concept. Whatever else it requires, honor must stand on the grounds of ethics and justice. Dennis's career as a natural extension of his character has been devoted to political ethics and justice, not only in ideal theory, but in actual practice. Uh, it's honorable and essential for a political philosopher to tend to the relevant facts and to the right ethical principles. And everybody who has been had the honor of being associated with Dennis throughout his career, sees that modeled day in and day out. He is the consummate democratic and university citizen. And you all know the first book he wrote was Democratic, the, the Democratic Citizen. And if you want a model in the academy or out of the Democratic Citizen, go no further than getting to know Dennis Thompson. He is the model of an engaged and inspired scholar. He accounts for the honor I feel in being here today. Fittingly, we have a special panel on the subject of an honorable profession to honor Dennis's consummately honorable character and his amazingly influential and honorable career. I can introduce the panel best by posing a question. What do dueling, foot binding, and the Atlantic slave trade all have in common? If you read the book, The Honor Code, How Moral Revolutions Happen, which was selected as one of the New York Times Book Review's top 100 notable books of 2010, you would know the answer. Each in its way was profoundly affected by the concept of honor which can best be described as a system of entitlements to respect. Moreover, if you read the Honor Code, you would also know something else, that its author is a trenchant observer, a sparkling writer, and a deep and insightful thinker. I am also proud to say he is a wonderful friend. Anthony Appiah was born in London, grew up in Ghana, earned his doctorate at Cambridge University. Although he trained in linguistic philosophy, Anthony has published widely about ethics, African and black cultural studies, racial identity, political theory, and philosophy of the mind. He is a novelist as well, whose works include Avenging Angel and my favorite title, Another Death in Venice. <laughs> Anthony is the Lawrence S. Rockefeller University Professor of Philosophy and Acting Director of the University Center for Human Values at Princeton University. Among his many honors is the National Humanities Medal recently bestowed upon him by President Obama. 
We are joined also by two exceptional respondents who will undoubtedly aid in our understanding of this capacious topic. Thomas Scanlon, Tim Scanlon, is the Alfred Professor of Natural Religion, Moral Philosophy, and Civil Polity here at Harvard, and a leading light in the field of moral and political philosophy. Uh, and it's also a wonderful, um, wonderful friend as well. Michael Frazier is an Associate Professor of Government and of Social Studies, dear to my heart, the major dear to my heart here at Harvard whose book, The Enlightenment of Sympathy, finds new relevance in classical political philosophy for contemporary political theory. Uh, my role as a moderator will be more in line with Martha Raddatz than Jim Lehrer. <laughs> I will actually keep time and make sure the panelists stay on time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Anthony Appiah. Um, after the many encomia to Dennis, another will be, would probably be uh, more than he could bear. So, <laughs> uh, so, so, rather than doing that, I'm going to boast about something myself, uh, which is that I have a, a, a Thompson number of two, because Amy has written with Dennis, and I've written with Amy. So, uh, <laughs> this is for those of you who are familiar with the concept of an Erdős number. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, but it is a great honor to have been asked to participate in this wonderful Festival of the Mind, and especially because, of, because it's a celebration of a wonderful philosopher and a great human being. I'm hoping that this will work better. Um, so, it is a great privilege to have been invited here to help celebrate Dennis. And I can think of no better way to do so than to reflect on a question that he spent a great deal of time both thinking about and encouraging others to think about, namely how we should bring normative concerns to bear on the life of the professions. I propose to explore today a set of questions about professional ethics. I'm interested, as much as anything else, in the idea of a professional ethos, in the idea that professional women and men are bound together in part by shared understandings of how they should conduct their work, and by networks of reciprocal attitudes to each other as people who respect or fail to meet the demands of that ethos. These qu three questions will guide what I have to say today. Why do we need professional norms that are distinct from general moral norms? I shan't say so much in defense of this claim, the claim that we need them, which has been much discussed, but I will need to take it for granted that we do. Much of what I say will, as a result, not make sense to anyone who doubts this. To discourage such doubts, it should only be necessary in this place to mention the work of Arthur Applebaum. But I will offer some brief reminders of arguments of his and others and some thoughts of my own. My second question is why are professionals particularly well placed to be the guardians and enforcers of professional norms? And finally, I'll explore a third question. How can honor be mobilized as a mechanism for sustaining these professional norms? And this is the idea on which I want to spend most of the time. It's my central claim that honor is a crucial resource here, and so I want to start by introducing an account of honor, mine, one that derives from work I did in my book, The Honor Code. There, I focused on questions about the role of honor in the processes that bring about moral change, mentioning the issues I want to focus on today only briefly and in passing. But the general account of honor that I found useful there will turn out, I think, to be helpful in this very different context, and so I'm going to ask, what is honor? And what do we need to know about it, first of all? Well, first of all, as Amy said, honor is a system of entitlements to respect or rights to respect. When we say that people are honorable, we mean that they are worthy of respect. Honor involves respect as an attitude towards persons then. And there are two important questions about how we should understand the basic formula here. What does respect involve? And what is the basis of the entitlements, the rights? Well, Stephen Darwell taught us to distinguish two different ways in which we can respect a person. One, which he called uh, appraisal respect, involves judging a person positively according to a standard. And doing well by a standard essentially means doing better than most others. It's in this sense that we respect Rafael Nadal for his tennis skills or Meryl Streep for her acting. And I shall uh, follow the convention of using the word esteem for this kind of respect. There's another kind of respect, though, recognition respect, that involves, to put it rather abstractly, 
treating people in ways that give appropriate weight to some fact about them. When we respect powerful people, say, judges in court or police officers when we're out driving, we treat them warily because they have the capacity to compel us to do things. Our respect recognizes the fact of that power. But we can also respect a sensitive person by speaking to him gently, or a disabled person by assisting her when she asks for help. Respecting people in this sense, in other words, doesn't require you to rate them especially highly. It's still respectful, even though it doesn't involve esteem. Because there are so many kinds of facts about people that we can recognize and respond to, recognition and respect for people can have a great variety of emotional tones and can come along with attitudes both positive and negative. When the Roman Emperor Caligula said, Odorint dometuant, let them hate so long as they fear, he was expressing his depraved delight in getting one sort of respect, but it wasn't the sort of positive respect that goes with honor. As a result, I want to insist that the sort of recognition and respect that's important for honor involves more than just giving appropriate weight to some facts about a person. It also requires, especially as we conceive it today, a positive attitude of a certain sort. I think, in fact, that the relevant attitude has the same emotional tone as when we esteem people highly. So from now on, when I talk about recognition and respect, I mean the kind that involves a positive regard for the person in virtue of the fact that it recognizes. Though this regard is found in esteem as well, it remains important, as I'll, I'll try to argue, to distinguish the different bases of the judgments associated with these different sorts of respect. So these two kinds of respect, esteem and positive recognition respect, correspond to two kinds of honor. There is competitive honor, which comes by degrees, depending on how successful you have been in meeting the standard. What makes you worthy of respect there is that you have done much better than the norm. And this respect, as I say, is a form of esteem. Then there's also what you could call peer honor, which governs relations among equals. Peer honor does not come by degrees. Either you have it or you don't. Recognition respect of a basic sort is now something we believe everyone is entitled to in the form of human dignity. So if honor is just an entitlement to respect, then dignity is a form of honor. However, in thinking about our second question, what is the basis of the entitlements, we have reason to see dignity as distinct from honor. When gentlemen dueled, they understood that the right to respect they were defending was assigned by a conventional social code, and they understood that the code was in conflict with morality and with religion. Two things in the code were conventional, at least. What it was that gained and lost you the respect of your peers, and the things that you could do, like challenging someone to a duel, to recover the right to respect, to re recover your honor. Dignity doesn't look to be code-dependent in either of these ways. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights starts in the first sentence of its preamble by insisting that, quote, recognition of the inherent dignity of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. To most thinkers before the democratic revolutions of the late 18th century, the idea of the inherent dignity of each person would have seemed absurd. Dr. Johnson's dictionary defines dignity as, quote, elevation of rank, grandeur of mean, elevation of aspect. None of these things could be inherent in everyone, given that they are things that some people have because other people don't have them. Elevation of rank is something you can have only if others are ranked below you. For thinkers like Hobbes and Burke, dignity like honor was something intrinsically hierarchical, tied up with hierarchies of what they might have called standing. So whatever dignity is today, in these more democratic times, it has to be something other than what it was in the past. Well, the close connection between honor and dignity, which is evident in Hobbes's coupling of them in a part of the paper that I'm not reading, suggests a place to look in thinking about what has happened to dignity, namely to the connection between dignity and respect. For one way to understand what has happened to the word dignity is to say that it's come to refer to a right to respect that people have simply in virtue of their humanity. Here are a few of the facts about people that we give proper weight to in acknowledging human dignity. That human beings have the capacity for creating lives of significance, that we can suffer, love, create, that we need food, shelter, and recognition by others. And these facts, which we might dub the grounds of dignity, make it appropriate to respond to people in ways that respect such fundamental human needs and capacities. Dignity is a right to respect, I think, but it is not grounded in conventional social codes, but in morality. So we have our answers to the two basic questions about the kind of right to respect that honor entails. 
It's a code-based entitlement, and the form of respect involved is either esteem or a recognition respect tinged with the positive attitude characteristic of esteem. Esteem is, in a sense, essentially hierarchical because it recognizes excellence against the standard. But recognition, respect, can be given, can be open to people without a competitive evaluation. And even esteem doesn't need to be a hierarchical attitude. That is, it doesn't have to involve thinking of the person esteemed as your superior uh, in general. Honors codes assign honor in all kinds of ways. The 18th century law of honor assigned the children of ladies and gentlemen a right to respect from birth. They didn't need to earn it. But they took it away from men and who failed to respond when they were accused of lying, even when the accuser was lying himself. So the codes also fix ways of losing honor, and losing honor leads in those who care about their honor to shame. Shame is the feeling appropriate to your own dishonorable behavior. The appropriate response from others is first to cease to respect you, and then actively to treat you with disrespect, as we used to say, people used to say, to contemn you, to treat you with contempt. Someone who cares about their own honor intrinsically rather than instrumentally has what we call, can call a sense of honor. Shame and self-respect are the natural accompaniments of respectively dishonorable and honorable behavior in those who have a sense of honor. Well, that's what honor is then, and how does it work? Well, respect and disrespect for one person can both be the result of things done by others, because your honor is always your honor as someone of a social, some social identity. That's, again, a contrast with dignity. Um, identity actually matters to honor in two quite distinct kinds of ways. First, identity matters because it determines what the honor code, the codes of honor require of you. Gender identity played a crucial role, for example, in determining what many codes of honor demanded, what behavior on the part of a person commanded or lost respect, depending on whether they were a man or a woman. In 18th century England, for example, they required men of the upper classes to answer challenges to a duel from other gentlemen. They required them not to answer challenges to duels from people who were not gentlemen. That was a way of losing your honor, dueling with a non-gentleman. Uh, the correct response to a non-gentleman was to hit him with your riding stick, your riding crop. Uh, the penalty for breaches of the code was the loss of honor, which meant that you lost your entitlement to respect. But identity matters in a second way, because you may share in the honor of those whose identity you share. We may both gain and lose honor, in part because of the successes and failures of those with whom we share an identity. So there's such a thing as collective honor, the honor of my family, my community, my country, and to bring us to today's topic, my profession. To be respected is, of course, to be respected by somebody. Usually, honor doesn't seek the respect of people in general. It requires the respect of some particular social group, which I'll call an honor world, a group of people who acknowledge the same codes. Finally, a person of honor cares not, or at least not only, about being respected, but about being worthy of respect. For the honorable person, honor itself is the thing that matters, not honor's rewards. It's something that is you care about in, in say, intrinsically. You want respect, but only the respect you're entitled to. The final crucial point, then, is that an honorable person wants to do what is worthy of respect according to the honor code, but doesn't conform to the code simply in order to get respect. Honor works best, then, in those who have a sense of honor. As Jeffrey Brannan and Philip Pettit pointed out in their excellent book, The Economy of Esteem, uh, esteem as a way of shaping our behavior is, in effect, policed by everybody in what I call the honor world. The reason is simple. People in an honor world automatically regard those who meet its codes with respect and automatically regard those who breach them with contempt. Because these responses are automatic, the system is, in effect, extremely cheap to maintain. It only requires us to respond in ways we are naturally inclined to respond anyway. There are no doubt a few human beings who care little about how others regard them. There are sociopaths who do not care being caught out in a lie. And perhaps at the other end of the moral extreme, there may be genuinely unself-regarding saints, people who think that um, being concerned for the regard of others is somehow a bad thing and who try very hard not to be concerned about it, perhaps because they're only concerned about how God regards them. But by and large, uh, though notice that is a kind of concern for regard, <laughs> 
But by and large, we humans respond to respect and contempt, not because we have instrumental reasons to do so, but because it's built into our moral natures to do so, our ethical natures. As John Locke put it once, contempt or want of due respect, discovered either in looks, words, or gesture from whomsoever it comes, brings always uneasiness with it, for nobody can contentedly bear being slighted. And if this is right, then the serious question about honor isn't whether we mobilize it in the service of moral or any other kind of virtue, but when and how. So as I said at the start, I want today to discuss one special way in which we can mobilize honor in the modern world, namely as professional honor. Here, the codes in question are the distinctive professional codes we speak of in discussing professional ethics. The honor world consists of the other members of one's profession, and the identity in question is one's professional identity as, say, a teacher, a lawyer, or a soldier. And let me begin with professional soldiering. It's a natural place to start, since the military is one place where honor is still regularly advertised and adverted to. So consider the codes of military honor they call on people as soldiers, or as Marines, or officers. There's a variety of relevant identities. And of course, as Americans or Pakistanis, as citizens. And while soldiers may feel shame or pride when their regiment or their platoon does badly or well, collective honor, fundamentally, it matters to them that they themselves should follow the military's codes of honor. It's worth asking why honor is helpful here. We could, after all, use the law all by itself to guide our armies. Military discipline makes easy use of all sorts of punishments, and mercenaries can be motivated by money. So why aren't these ordinary forms of social regulation, the market and the law, enough to manage an army, as they are enough to manage, say, such other state functions as the maintenance of the highways? Well, first of all, both these other forms of regulation require surveillance. If we're, able, if we're to be able to pay you for your, pay you your bonus, or punish you for your offenses, someone has to be able to find out what you have done. But when the battle is hardest, everything is obscured by the fog of war. If the aim of a soldier were just to get his bonus or escape the brig, he would have no incentive to behave well at the very moment when we most require it. Of course, we could devote large amounts of expensive effort to surveillance. We could equip each soldier with a device that monitored his every act. But that would have psychological and moral costs, as well as significant financial ones. And anyway, it's only recently become possible to do that kind of thing. By contrast, honor, which is grounded in the individual soldier's own sense of honor and that of his or her peers, can be effective without extensive surveillance. And unlike a system of law or a market contract, anyone who is around and belongs to the honor world will be an effective enforcer of it, so that the cost of enforcement of honor is actually quite low. And as Brennan and Pettit noticed, we don't have to worry about guarding its guardians. Most of the other systems of regulation give focused power to particular people to implement the system. Honor codes are uh, enforced by everybody. There's another reason for favoring honor over law as a mechanism for motivating soldiers. Sorts of sacrifice that are most useful in warfare require people to take risks that involve doing things that are supererogatory. They're morally desirable acts that ask too much of us to be morally required. To punish someone for um, failing to do something that they have no duty to do is morally wrong, since it's normally permissible, however, to offer a financial reward for doing what is supererogatory. You might think that the right way to regulate military behavior, if you could solve the problem of the fog of war, would be by financial incentives. But once we have a set of shared codes about military honor, we also have commitments that make us think of money as the wrong idiom for rewarding military prowess. It is symbolically appropriate. We don't give soldiers bonuses for bravery. We give them medals. And more importantly, we honor them. We give them the respect we know they deserve. Now, our modern standing armies have kept in place a world of military honor, many of whose loyalties and sentiments I suspect that Alexander the Great would recognize, as would, indeed, Shakespeare's Duke of Bourbon, who, Bourbon, who, uh, realizing at Agincourt that the day is lost, cries out, shame and eternal shame, nothing but shame, let's die in honor. Soldiers who think like that make formidable opponents. With this model case before us, we can return to the three questions that I said would guide me today. 
Why do we need professional norms that are distinct from general moral aims? Why are professionals particularly well placed to be their guardians? And why is honor a good mechanism of enforcement? Why do we need the norms that are distinct? Well, the military case exemplifies the general answer to this question. In some contexts, we need people to do both more and less than morality requires. Soldiers are equipped to do great harm. Ordinarily, a person so equipped should exercise extreme caution in the use of her equipment. We'd like people generally not to be trigger happy. We'd like them to feel badly if they kill others, even in self-defense, and to think badly of people who don't. But once the battle is on, we need people who are willing and able to kill and psychologically equipped to deal with the consequences of killing others. So we want soldiers to be different from the rest of us in their moral responses to the deaths they cause. We want them to feel less than civilians should, and on the other hand, we'd like them to do more. We want them to be willing to sacrifice for the good of the platoon or the cause in ways we can't morally require. The soldier who throws himself on the grenade to save his comrades is doing something that is, in the context, a very good thing, but ordinary morality doesn't require, require this kind of heroism. I think Ethics for Adversaries shows that professional norms generally are like this. Lawyers and executioners are not just permitted, but actually required to behave in ways that would not ordinarily be morally permissible. Professional relationships can commend doing things that are ordinarily supererogatory, Professional norms can require you thus to do more, both less and more than ordinary moral considerations. But of course, not all uh, professional norms must be distinct from the ordinary moral norms that rightly govern us. It must, for example, be a central norm of doctors and bankers that they shouldn't, Ketteris no doubt paribus, deceive their patients or clients. And of course, one reason that you shouldn't deceive your clients, when you shouldn't, is that deception is, other things being equal, wrong. But there's a further wrongness in deceiving a client or patient, so it seems to me that derives from the role of trust in the relationship between the professional and his client in dealing with both health and money. To see this, it's only necessary to point out that we're especially appalled by the bankers deceiving her client uh, about what she has done with his money. Deception, on the other hand, about the state of her relationship with her spouse, while no doubt wrong, at least if it's your client's business, doesn't strike at the heart of the relationship in the same way. So even the general norms against deception can have a special shape in a professional context. Second question, why are professionals particularly well placed to be the guardians of professional norms and enforcers? The general answers here are all straightforward enough. The professionals are better placed than anyone else to understand what is required on the part of fellow professionals if the profession is to achieve its distinctive objects. They are better placed than outsiders, too, to assess how hard or easy it is to achieve a certain standard. And because they are themselves committed to the standards, they will naturally respect those who do best by those standards and naturally condemn those who fail to meet them. Teachers can tell who's doing a good job of teaching. Doctors know who the best clinicians are. Lawyers know who are the masters and mistresses of litigation. This doesn't mean we can just leave the policing professions to their members. For a profession, like any other social group, can develop interests and pursue them in ways that are bad for the rest of us. There's a place for regulation backed by legal sanctions. But if most members of a profession have internalized norms that are well designed to produce the goods that define it, education for teachers, health for doctors, justice for lawyers, and so on, then they will be sustaining those norms simply by displaying the patterns of disrespect and disrespect that are natural in someone witnessing conformity to and divergence from standards she believes in. Why is honor a good mechanism of enforcement? Well, now suppose that in addition to internalizing the norms, the professional has a sense of professional honor that treats the norms as an honor code. The code, as a professional code, will address people through their professional identities. That is, it will ask people to do things as lawyers and teachers. And there will be three aspects to that sense of honor. First, professionals with a sense of honor will feel that those of their fellow professionals who keep the code are worthy of respect in the honor world of the profession, and that those who don't are contemptible. They will want to be worthy of that professional respect themselves, and to avoid being professionally contemptible. Second, they will also have professional esteem for those who excel in their pursuit of the profession, 
and they will want to excel and be entitled to the professional esteem of their peers. And they will also, third, want to feel that the profession itself is honorable, entitled to respect, because they understand the contribution it makes to society better, perhaps, than anyone outside the profession. They know, lawyers know what lawyers do. These are the components of the psychology of professional honor. A special concern for being worthy of the respect of one's peers in virtue of one's conformity to the special norms of the profession, a desire to be worthy of esteem in the practice of the, uh, of the profession, and a hope that the profession as a whole will be worthy of the respect of everyone. These are concerns with honor and not just with respect because they're not, because they're not about getting respect but about being worthy of it. And as I said early on, a sense of honor entails a desire to get only the respect to which you are entitled. Um, this is what, what I think of. This is the Bernie Madoff problem. At the heart of professional honor is the individual esteem one gets from your profession, one's professional peers and the collective esteem of your profession. <coughs> These things are connected because in behaving dishonorably, a member of the profession risks dishonoring not just herself, but also her professional peers. Teachers, doctors, lawyers, and bankers like soldiers all do many things where it's very hard for, or expensive for outsiders to keep an eye on how conscientious they are being. We have every reason to hope that they will do more than can be required of them by their contracts of employment. And as we saw in the crises of the American economy in the first decade of this millennium, this behavior of individual bankers seeking to make profits can, in the aggregate, impose large costs on all of us. If they develop a sense of professional honor, we have a better chance, I claim, that they will be more likely to do these things, to do the things that we need them to do. They will be doing them in part because they want to be entitled to self-respect, a sentiment one cannot feel if one knows one isn't entitled to it. But they will also be sustained by the fact that in a world of competent professionals, those who are worthy of respect will be getting the respect they deserve. Thank you. Stand up. Stand up. Good for the diet. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Well, you, you don't have to be an expert on the subject of honor, which... Yeah, that's it. Or I can have Whichever you prefer. You can stick it in your pocket, yeah. Yep. There you go. Wait till that's off. Can everyone hear me now? Yes. No? Well, as I was attempting to say, um, <laughs> You don't have to be an expert on the subject of honor to imagine what an incredible honor it is for me to be here today, <laughs> honoring Dennis. Um, over, as I've entered into this profession, I've had this marvelous and uncanny experience of, of the names on, on my bookshelf jumping out and becoming flesh and blood people. And, and you know, Appia and Scanlon becoming Tony and Tim, and, and this, this unified authorial voice that I thought of as Gutman and Thompson becoming Amy and Dennis. And, and no longer unified in voice, either. <laughs> <laughs> At the time. Um, and, and it's really been a, a, a remarkable uh, experience for me. Um, and one of the things I've always loved about Dennis's and, and Anthony's work alike is how they're both even-handed without being wishy-washy. Uh, that they can both see the other side of the issue, the strengths and weaknesses of the position they're putting forward while still putting forward that position. So in a book like The Honor Code, Anthony is completely clear that there are risks as well as benefits to a reliance on, on honor. But he still thinks that honor is a resource we cannot afford to forego. And, and the thesis I'm going to be putting forward in my comments uh, is that whatever the risks and benefits of honor are generally, and I think Tim will be addressing those general issues in, in his comments, I think the risks are particularly great when we apply the concept of honor to professional ethics. And I think if we go through Anthony's claims one by one, we see why that would be the case. First, the claim that we need professional norms that are distinct from general norms. That's undoubtedly true, but my worry is 
we don't always have the professional norms that we need. Uh, this is uh, a thesis that can be understood as, as a, an applied version, of the more general thesis that Arthur defends as practice positivism. The idea that descriptively, the social norms that govern a role in institution or practice are what they are, sociologically, not what they ought to be. And only when a role is as it ought to be, morally, does it create moral obligations. Arthur also believes that roles can never create moral permissions to do what would, outside of that role, be morally wrong. He, he does, though, think they can be an important source of obligations, but never directly, only in a mediated way. So even if we don't accept mm -hmm. Arthur's claim that roles don't create permissions, only obligations, and, and I think Anthony has given us some reason to doubt that in things like the military case. And even if we think there are certain roles or practices which are directly uh, moralized, perhaps parent or friend or something like that, I'm going to put forward uh, a narrower thesis that I'll call professional positivism or profession positivism. Not that I'm a professional positivist. I'm, I'm not. I'm a value theorist. Um, but the idea that our professional norms are descriptively what they are, not necessarily what they ought to be. As a result, some professions exist which maybe shouldn't exist at all. There simply should be no professional torturers. Um, and many of us think, if we're opposed to the death penalty, that there shouldn't be professional executioners either. Uh, and even more people think uh, nowadays that there shouldn't even be professional politicians. Uh, and, and I think it's important when we're discussing office and responsibility that to say an office brings with it responsibilities does not mean that those who hold that office should be professionalized in the sense of having specialized training and making their career off of holding such offices and the sense of belonging to an honor world of other professionals who also hold those sort of offices. Um, and now the reason why there shouldn't be torturers or executioners is because those practices don't pursue any good. Uh, but I think the case of politicians is different. Even if a practice does pursue a real and genuinely morally valuable good, that doesn't necessarily mean that it should be pursued by professionals. In the early modern era, there was a strong view among many that we should have citizen soldiers rather than a mm -hmm. professional standing army. And there are plenty of people who think we should only have citizen officers rather than professional politicians holding political <laughs> office. But even if we reject that argument and think, no, this is an activity that must not be performed by amateurs, that doesn't mean that the professionals who pursue that activity are best left under the professional norms that currently guide them. I would maintain that the three activities of hairstyling, dentistry, and surgery are all things I don't want to see performed by amateurs. But that's no defense of the medieval profession of the barber surgeon. Uh, because although I think professionals should be pursuing those activities, I think three different kinds of professionals should be pursuing hairstyling, dentistry, and surgery, respectively. Uh, and for any given profession that might exist in our own world, we can ask, does it make sense for this profession to exist as it does with this combination uh, of certain activities and skills required to perform them and exclusion of other activities? Should professors really be combining teaching and research? Or are we the barber surgeons of the 21st century? <laughs> um, or maybe we should be doing teaching and research and more, as Dennis has. We should be engaged in, in public activism, or maybe internet-based instruction, or become stars of Japanese television. There are, there are a lot of other activities that maybe should be combined with the profession of the professoriate. Um, so as a result, a great deal of critical scrutiny is needed to determine whether our professions are as they ought to be. Uh, so that gets to the second claim, that professionals are particularly well-placed to be the guardians and enforcers of professional norms. Well, yes and no. Uh, I think professionals within a set of professional norms, descriptively, uh, have a great deal of epistemic privilege to know how those norms work and what they're like. But at the same time, there are a number of forces working on them that counterbalance those epistemic resources that might lead them to be some of the worst uh, evaluators of whether or not their professions are as they ought to be. 
uh, just to talk about two so of those forces. First of all, uh, as, as I hope all of you know, once you're sufficiently immersed in a profession, what really, and I am something of an instrumentalist about professions, what you began in the sense of being committed to the pursuit of some sort of moral or social good can quickly take on a sense of being an end in itself. Uh, what once was something that you chose to do to help others, if you experience it as a vocation, can come to feel like something you were chosen to do by some force higher than yourself for intrinsic reasons. Now, we can argue about whether or not that is in some sense true or whether it's a useful illusion that helps us uh, commit ourselves and recommit ourselves each day to performing our profession. But if you really are working under that view, you're in a particularly poor position to evaluate whether what you feel you have been called to do is actually doing what it ought to be doing. That would be an evasion of, of your calling. And I think there's a second reason why professionals are not necessarily well placed, indeed maybe worse placed, uh, to be the guardians and enforcers of their professional norms as they ought to be, not as they are, but as they ought to be, is because professionals, by virtue of having an identity as professionals, will, for the reasons that, that Anthony made so clear in the ethics of identity, have a strong motivation and perhaps even a significant degree of justification in privileging the interests and needs of fellow members of their profession over the interests and needs of other people. Now, to be sure, the ethics of identity is primarily about uh, identities related to race, gender, religion, nationality, <laughs> sexual orientation, and so on. But even throughout that book, butlers, hairdressers, and philosophers stand alongside men, gays, Americans, Catholics as examples of identities. And identities in this sense, as, as Anthony so correctly pointed out, create forms of solidarity. That someone is an ex, he says, can be a perfectly proper reason for treating him differently from others. Because identification constitutively makes being an ex figure among our reasons for action, neutrality among identities, far from being an attractive moral ideal, is barely intelligible for us as individuals. So, uh, as an act of solidarity with my fellow political theorists, as uh, a acting out of a sense of honor for the profession of political theory, our collective honor, I will have a tendency to be biased in favor of the interests of those inside the profession as opposed to those outside of it. So that leads to the third claim, that honor can and should be mobilized as a mechanism for sustaining these professional norms. And I think if you've bought what I've said on the first two claims so far, this claim becomes problematic as well. Uh, enforcing uh, proper behavior through norms of honor is for the reasons that, that Brennan and, and Pettit so correctly point out, cheap and automatic, which certainly makes it uh, appealing in certain ways. Who wouldn't want something cheap and automatic? Except what is cheap and automatic also is relatively difficult to reform relatively difficult to subject to critical moral reflection. Um, it, it's, and I think this is a problem with honor codes and honor worlds in general. But it's particularly a problem, as is the case in professional honor, when the honor world is exclusionary in some way. That if the honor world is global, since the moral realm uh, includes all human beings, if your honor realm includes, uh, your honor world includes all human beings as well, it's less likely to be problematic. But if the honor world is exclusionary, if you simply don't care what non-professionals think about your performance, you know, he's, he's an economist, what does he know about political theory? Hmm. They're just lay people, what do they know about political theory? Uh, then I think an exclusionary honor world can only be reformed if someone within the honor world overcomes all those forces that I was just describing and takes a keen interest in the needs and interests and perspectives of those outside the honor world. And that itself can't be motivated by the search for honor within the honor world. So there's a real danger when professions are strongly professionalized and each becomes its own self-contained world which excludes the views and interests of others. 
So what, what is the solution to this problem? Is it simply greater reliance on professional honor? No, I think it is greater reliance on non-professionalization, mm -hmm. anti-professionalization, which sounds heretical when we're trying so hard to professionalize our grad students. But if we actually look at the, the ideal, and I, I hope you understand how complimentary I mean this, Dennis, one of the things I've most admired about Dennis is his lack of professionalism in this <laughs> sense. Um, the, the idea that um, we must only do analytic philosophy for we are philosophers, certainly a kind of professionalism that I thank goodness that Anthony has rejected. Uh, we must only do uh, professional training because we are teaching in professional schools. Uh, in his intellectual life, bringing people together, ideas together, institutions together, Dennis has been an opponent of over-narrow professionalization and over-narrow honor world. Just look at the diversity of people judging me right now. <laughs> uh, if I were to put forward an argument that would only appeal to a scholastic, narrow band within political theory, I would be ashamed in front of many of you. And the fact that Dennis has brought together such an expanded and expansive intellectual honor world is, I think, the greatest possible benefit he could have done to all of us. Now, if I can allow myself a bit of professional chauvinism. One minute. One minute. <laughs> One minute of professional. You can go on about Dennis as long as you want. <laughs> One minute of professional chauvinism. Mike, Michael Rosen recently described political theory as, as, as the, the oasis with an open borders policy in the desert where the trade, intellectual trade routes intersect. Uh, I think political theory's great virtue is that it is the least disciplined of disciplines, the least professionalized of the academic professions. Um, and insofar as Dennis has been uh, the chief gardener and the tender uh, of our beautiful little oasis, I think his lack of professionalism has been consummate professionalism <laughs> as, as a political theorist opposed to the narrow horizons of too, too small an honor world. So, so thank you, Anthony, and, and thank you, Dennis. Okay. <laughs>
uh, had maintained in public that the Geneva Conventions were quaint anachronisms which shouldn't be taken seriously. I, I've seldom seen a group of people who were as deeply angry uh, as the officer corps at, at that academy who were trying to inculcate uh, a sense of honor, uh, but they were doing it by trying to get people to see why uh, the limits to killing uh, th that they were being asked to do were appropriate in themselves and to base their honor on that independent, independent idea. Uh, I happened to recently read that during the uh, Battle of the Pacific in World War II, uh, the Japanese Admiralty tried very hard to discourage the commanders of ships from feeling that they had to go down with their ships or commit suicide if their ships were sunk in battle because they needed them. They were running out of qualified captains, but they found this very difficult to do because the, the naval code of honor <laughs> was resistant to it. So I, this suggests to me that, that, that honor is an important thing when it's got the right, when it's got the right uh, content. But if this is, an, I, I don't think Anthony would uh, disagree with this, but I want to push it a little farther and say, if a sense of honor is to be cultivated and admired, only if the code on which it is based is properly cultivated and admired, what is added by packaging this particular set of normative attitudes under the heading of honor? Once a person comes to think of any code as important, once he, he or she subscribes to an ethos, uh, then that person will feel a sense of loss and shame at f failures to live up to that ethos and will be reinforced and, uh, by others uh, expressing these feelings. Now, one might call this, we might say anytime people take on uh, an ethos in this sense, a code, um, they, they've developed a sense of honor. But if, if, if we're going to say that, then I agree with everything that Anthony said, but the idea of honor is doing no, no work. But Anthony wants it to do some work, and the question is, what additional work is it doing? What is gained by packaging this idea of accepting, internalizing an ethos in terms of honor? It might seem that whether anything is gained, something is lost by putting it in these terms. Um, think of the difference between two reasons a person might have for keeping a promise. One is that she owes, owes it to the promisee to do what she said she would do. The other is that a gentleman doesn't go back on his word. It seems to me something is lost in the case of a person who keeps a promise primarily for the second reason. The promisee is left out. Now Anthony offers some answers to my question of what is gained by putting things in terms of honor when he speaks of the importance of usefulness of mobilizing, that was his word, honor, as a support for better professional conduct. And he mentions three advantages of this strategy. The first is that mobilizing people to proper professional conduct through a sense of honor is superior to doing it through law uh, because the sanction is internal and doesn't require uh, courts and ex external enforcement. But that's true of the, of the inculcation of any ethos and doesn't depend upon its being, getting, having the particular structure of, of, of honor. Second, um, getting people to be moved by a sense of honor, he says, it provides the right kind of motivation for good conduct in, in contrast to getting people to behave better by promising them bonuses, uh, other economic rewards. That's true, but it's also true of motivation by any sense of right, right and wrong uh, properly understood. Finally, he says that sometimes we need people in particular roles to be motivated to do more or perhaps less than universal uh, impersonal morality requires. Honor, based on a code peculiar to a particular group, has the needed flexibility for a basis of professional uh, ethics, which must be more specialized than morality general requirements that apply in the same way to everyone. But I don't see why honor is superior to simple motivation by a recognition of the merits and importance of the underlying code. As I said, these, are, these two are equally internal as contrasted with law. And the content and normative force of the underlying code need not be limited to those of the same universal morality that applies to everybody. We have reason for adopting particular standards in universities, uh, in, in uh, law firms even, and in other, in other professional roles. So a content-based account rather than an honor-based account can have the variability required for professional ethics. So here's an alternative view. Professions are defined by special relationships of trust and responsibility 
that hold between professionals and their clients or beneficiaries and between fellow professionals, people who put themselves forward as professionals as opposed to people who are offering you a bargain that you can or can't refuse, um, are, are putting themselves forward as bound by an ethos of trust and responsibility, promising to be offering the assurance that they're guided by uh, your interests or the proper goals of, of, that define that profession. A failure to live up to the requirements of these relationships, with these, ex these relations of trust and responsibility, is the occasion for special forms of blame and guilt, including the loss of the re relationship in question. This loss, failure to be considered any longer a, a, a person who can claim that kind of trust or claim to exercise that kind of responsibility may amount to a loss of honor. But that description, that is that it belongs to honor, doesn't seem to me to point to what's most important. What's important is the value of the underlying, underlying norms and, and the values that give them, that give them support. <clears throat> Finally, this account has the advantage of avoiding the overly self-regarding flavor of honor. It brings in other people in the right way, as in my example of promising, not just as those people in whose eyes we may be valued or devalued, but as those whose interests and expectations are the justifying basis for the code that we have reason to adhere to. In addition, Dennis has emphasized in Restoring Responsibility, for example, uh, in his paper on institutional corruption, uh, which was discussed uh, yesterday, um, that professional relationships, what, uh, to use the term I've just employed, ha often have an institutional nature. Our relations with others are those of someone in a certain institutional role uh, with, within, a, within a business, uh, within, a, within a political system, or for example, within, within a university. And our individual responsibility is bound up with the, with the responsibility of, and indeed depends on the justifiability of, those institutions. Honor, by contrast, invites us to focus on the merits of the individual alone. Perhaps it can be supplemented and enriched, but that's the direction in which it seems to point our thoughts. Now, perhaps we should distinguish here between the philosophical and normative question of why it is right and important to behave in certain ways and the psychological question of what actually moves people to do this or moves them to behave in better ways than they otherwise might, even at some cost to themselves. Both the normative question and the psychological question are important in practical ethics, which, name, which aims not just to teach philosophy, but to educate practitioners in the way that will make a difference and change institutions so that they will re reproduce these motivational patterns over time. This has been the concern of the Center for Ethics and the Professions and continues to be a concern under, under, under Larry. So our, our, our emphasis on practical ethics needs to take into account both psychology uh, and the, uh, the underlying normative arguments. Dennis, at the center and in his own work, tried hard to do both these things, and he sees them, I believe, as inv inevitably linked. The faculty fellows at the center, he hoped, would not just acquire certain values, they wouldn't just be inducted into a group with a code of honorable conduct, but they would come to see why it is that these particular standards were important. They would adopt them because they saw the rationale for them. And he tried to do the for former, get them to adopt the ethos, by doing the latter, get, to get them to form a sense of honor, if you want to call it that, by coming to understand the importance of the code that forms its content. Now maybe this direction of institutionalization and possible institutional reform is naive. Maybe the most effective way to make people better is to activate their susceptibility to a sense of honor. That is to say, their innate attraction to being part of a group that has a code and a sense of its own superiority and use this innate susceptibility in a way that levers them into accepting standards that incidentally, and apart from this levering psychological mechanism, happen to be a moral improvement. I worry that adopting this as a mode of professional education or reform would be a form of manipulation. It would show a lack of respect, if you'll pardon the word, for the practitioners by treating them in a way that they have, independent of the idea of respect, good reason to object to. It seems to me that in trying to influence others to behave better, as in our own thinking about what's right, we should start from the underlying values on which everything depends. Start what's for, with what is right and therefore honorable rather than with honor. 
the normative force of honor to sum these things up is transparent to that of the underlying code. If this is accepted, I have no objection to honor, but it seems to be doing no work. If it's not accepted, then it's, honor seems to me dubious, both as a basis for our individual thinking about what to do and as a psychological mechanism for getting other people to do it. Thank you very much. Let me uh, frame two questions to Anthony that I think Michael and Tim's comments raise and then op ask Anthony to answer and then open it up for all of your questions and comments. So Dennis's career has been, as we've all recognized, uh, devoted to what might, what might one say, to paraphrase Max Weber, politics as a profession, politics as an eth understanding politics as an ethical and honorable profession. Uh, Michael, uh, one of the challenges Michael's comments raise uh, was put most succinctly, I think, by George Bernard Shaw, who said, all professions are conspiracies against the laity. And basically, Michael, you would like to see fewer conspiracies against the laity and hence less professionalization. So, Anthony, that's one question for you. Um, the set, that's Michael. Let me just put that as the biggest question challenge Michael sets down. Tim um, s says when politicians, I'm just focusing on politics as a profession now, but this would apply to surgeons as well, and I'll give you a surgeon story uh, since I spend quite a bit of time with surgeons who are also faculty members. Um, what Tim says is when politicians uh, can assure us that they are acting ethically, then honor has the right content. Um, but what work is honor doing uh, that is not manipulative, okay? Uh, and my surgeon's story is uh, a very, uh, very expert, terrific surgeon, very honored in the field. I uh, was giving a friend of mine, somebody who works for me, advice because she got two opinions as to what kind of surgery she should have. This is a true story. And so she went to the surgeon, let me just call him Larry Jones, and um, she said, Dr. Jones, why should I do it the way you have advised rather than this other way? And he looked her in the eye and he said, because I said so. And the, it, was, it took patient advocates. This is an analogy to politics. Politics puts it in high relief. But it took a kind of democratization in, with this, in a soft sense in which politics shows it in high relief. It took patient advocates to get the honor code of surgeons to be democratized so that now it includes being able to explain to very intelligent people, of whom my friend was one, why you should do it this way rather than the way they expertly know just because they said so. So the Tim question is, once you know what the right thing to do as a professional, what work, additional work that does honor do that isn't dangerous in the sense of putting a wall, an unnecessarily high wall, between what professionals think they know internally versus what they can learn from learning more from the laity. Um, well, first of all, thank you both very much. Uh, I, oh, yeah, please take this. Um, first of all, thank you both very much. Uh, and uh, I mean, I suppose, well, on the, on the sort of question about skepticism, I mean, it, it, both of those questions presuppose a certain kind of skepticism <laughs> about professionalization. And um, I, what I suppose I want to say is professionalization, like everything else, has its bad sides. Uh, and uh, it's right that um, it's not defensible to organize uh, a responsiveness to considerations of professional honor in a profession that shouldn't exist. Uh, nor is it uh, right to have uh, professional honor organized around professional norms that are um, 
as it were, corrupt in relation to the function of the profession, that, that fail to allow the profession or get in the way of the professions doing what it should do. And um, that's why uh, professions need regulation. Uh, where, where they have significant externalities, as I said, and I didn't wish to suggest that uh, uh, professional honor should, should be a substitute for, for regulation, uh, merely that it was a useful, uh, it could be a useful adjunct. But it, it's true that it, unless the norms in question are, are appropriate to the function of the profession, uh, it, can just, it, it could just get in the way. So just some observations about that question. Um, uh, Michael said that, that honor, uh, that the institutionalization of something through an honor code can be very resistant to change, and so uh, that, that was one of the sort of extra problems posed once you've connected professionalization with honor. I, my, my own view about that is that it's, I'm, you know, I wrote a book about changing honor systems, so uh, yes, it can be uh, hard to do, but, um, but some of the most important moral changes of the last 200 years have occurred by exactly that mechanism, the mechanism of the reform of honor codes. So, um, so now I go back to the sort of fundamental question that I think you know, Tim is, is raising, which is whether there's enough uh, distinctiveness to the character of the psychological mechanisms associated with honor for it to be worth drawing attention to the role in which the role that they can play in the sustenance of norms. And here I think we may have just a disagreement about what the, what the structure is, because um, I, I said that, and I believe, that, um, that the sense of honor has a certain value, uh, and that it's internally motivating in the sort of way, of course, that mor moral norms um, should be. But um, the point about honor is that those, that sense of honor is embedded in a structure of relationships that includes the sustenance that you get from the respect you earn by conformity to the norm. So it's, uh, it's an intrinsically social. That's why the honor world has to figure in the, in the account. And um, uh, I think that it's extremely hard to do some of the things that uh, uh, professional norms would urge us to do without that back, backup mechanism. It's true that uh, sort of in the ideal case, you'll do the right thing because it's right, but um, including the right thing under the, under the specific norms of the profession, which have been justified by a wider moral consideration of the role of the profession in society, not, not the, the general moral right, but the right against that background. But um, given that people pretty much will inevitably develop, uh, if they have professional relationships, they, that is, relationships with fellow professionals, inevitably will, I think, develop something like this structure. Uh, I think the right thing to do is to think about how to manage it, to worry about the things that Michael worried about, uh, uh, to make the case from the outside of professions, where we, as, as happened in the, precisely in the way you described in your surgeon story, uh, though knowing perfectly well that there will also be people within the profession who see these difficulties and will be our allies in, in trying to change the norms, uh, and who will be better placed than most outsiders to think about how to bring about those changes. Um, so, you know, Michael kindly said that I um, am someone who, as it were, sees the, the downside of the things that I'm, whose upside I'm proposing. Uh, he didn't put it, uh, he put it more elegantly than that. Um, uh, I do, I mean, I, you know, the book is full of problems with honor, and I, I agree that these are problems, but I do think that, it, that um, the sort of, I don't think that um, the sort of transparency that Tim is in favor of, uh, is likely to be as effective. Mm -hmm. I would like to say one final thing, which, which wasn't in your questions, but is a response to, to something that I think very central to, um, to Tim's objection, which was his, his worry about um, honor being overly self-regarding. Mm -hmm. Now, two things. First, as I've just tried to insist, it's also very other-regarding because it's about it's about thinking of yourself as being entitled to certain attitudes on the part of other people. It's about being worthy uh, of respect among people who know what they're doing. So it, it, in that sense, it's, it's very other regarding. But still, this idea that there's something wrong with self-regarding this is very deep in our Western tradition. And as the Stoics had this thought, and so did the... And so, so, I mean, so, so does much sort of Christian thought. Um, 
I uh, don't share this view. I think that uh, central to ethical life is not just uh, what we do, but who we are, that being the right, being a person of a certain sort and being a good person of that sort is important to leading a decent life. And uh, if that's a kind of self-regard, which it is, I don't, I don't share the sense, the long-standing sense uh, of uh, dislike for it that I think is, is very much part of the Western tradition. And this may be to do with having perhaps been brought up in a little bit outside it in a place where a concern for these, uh, for what was called animionam, uh, which is roughly speaking respect in, in the society that I spent my childhood in, uh, is taken to be a sort of evident part of what you think about, and, and it comes, it, it's connected with this, another thing that Tim is skeptical about, which is uh, identities. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the goodness and badness of one's life as, a, as, a, as various things, as a man, as a citizen, as a member of a family, as a member of a church, and so on. Uh, and I just think that that's, uh, the being concerned with that is, if you think that's wrong, then you have a certain moral view, which I think is just incorrect. There are so many. Uh, uh, Arthur Applebaum. Oh, you said you'd do that for me. There, there's something. There's something that links the, the conflict that we're having, the disagreement we're having here, and the disagreement that we had uh, this morning. And here's a, a, a modest proposal for maybe softening the disagreement, which is that um, to make explicit something that, of course, is very implicit both here and in Jeremy's talk, which is we, we need a political philosophy, not just a moral philosophy of roles and, and honor and, and, and these systems of what we're talking about. And, and if we, we think of this and try to understand this as a political philosophy problem, then we introduce questions of legitimate authority. And this might soften some, some of the conflicts and make them less straightforwardly balancing between values if we understand some of these um, problems that actors in roles and, in, or in honor codes face, which is that um, one has a substantive view about what should be done, but of course one is in a soft sort of way a member of a self-governing group that has a structure of, um, of authority to it, and uh, one needs to decide what to do within that structure one thing you could do, which Larry actually gestured to this morning, was, um, well, you have interpretive license. Every profession that's, that's worthy of the name um, has within it many, a lot of degrees of freedom for understanding how it should be practiced. And here's a proposal. It sort of you know, comes off of um, Dworkin's moral reading of the law, but it's not, not so much a moral reading of the law, but a, a legitimate reading of your profession. How can you interp honestly interpret your profession, given its degrees of freedom, so that it still has the kind of collective authority over you that you thought it did. If you can't, if there's no way of doing so, then straightforwardly you step outside and you say, well, this, this honor code or this profession has no authority over me, and I'm, go I'm going to do the right thing. But notice that this has much more structure to it than simply saying, on the one hand, I've got this value, on the other hand, I've got this other value, what am I supposed to do? That's a question, right? <laughs> if anyone wants to respond, that's fine. This, uh, there you go. Jenny. You'll use them, everyone, uh, use the mic. In regard to what work honor does, is it possible that it does no moral work but does psychological work? That is to say, we're pretty weak beings, are us humans. And so being good, just because it's good, is a good thing to do, but sometimes we can't do it. And so if we have a scaffolding around us that is, um, for example, the scaffolding of honor or the scaffolding of a profession and the sense that we're responding not only to what is good, which would be the best thing to do if we were not weak, um, then maybe honor is something we fall back on. So when you said that the program combined philosophical questions and psychological questions and the psychological included the institutional, perhaps honor falls on, on the psychological side and the institutional side deeply psychological, and and therefore it does work in that realm, but it, you're correct possibly in saying that it does no mor extra moral work, no analytic work within the, mor within the world of so, moral philosophy. So why doesn't it do more work 
when you need, when you say because we're weak, it's another way of saying because we're human, right? I mean, we don't just do things in, for the Kantian reasons uh, as much as it would be moral, purely moral, uh, to do it. So then, it do, then honor does a lot of work. Well, that's just what I was saying. But in other words, I agreed with Tim. And then I disagreed with him, and so I was wondering how that could be. And I thought, I will agree with you that it's doing no moral work, no, but it might be doing some psychological work. That's, that's and it could do some institutional work. And I institutional mean, some work. Some of the things I, I Dennis that in. Is, exactly, precisely is re recommended in Restoring Responsibility and Ethics in Congress, and he came up with the idea that we did in Compromise of the Pulitzer Prize for Explanatory Journalism in Politics, is to honor people who do the right thing because we know that professionals can't be always trusted to do the right thing. So honor, therefore, can even have an institutional uh, uh, manifestation. Tim, you wanted to say something, and then I'm going to recognize next question. Well, I don't know if I Michael. should try to respond to, 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 to Jenny. Just in response to Anthony's remark about this uh, other regarding character, I said, well, there's one way which it's, it honors other regarding. It regards the others by whom we, we are concerned to be honored. But I thought that leaves out the beneficiaries. Right? My, my, my class will disapprove of me if I, do, if I don't keep my word. Rather, leaves out the interest of the person perhaps outside the class to whom I made the promise. That, that was the, I said it, it, bring, it may bring in others, but it didn't bring them in, in the way that I thought was fund, fundamental. I certainly agree that we're all sustained by the thought that other people are properly going to criticize us if we don't do something. Uh, if, we, if, we, uh, if we, and it's not just that they would criticize us, but we think they'd be justified in criticizing us even if they wouldn't. That, that, that comes from the internalization of any view about what I ought to do, just part of the package. Um, and if, if we want to call that honor, then I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. But, but it seemed, the honor seems, because it involves this distinctive group-centered uh, idea, seemed to me to be adding, being more special than that. But maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm over-reading, in which case I, I apologize. Michael Doyle? Uh, this, pick, this picks up on, on Jenny's remark, and it adds to the moral philosophy and the psychology, sort of a rational sociology of, of honor, in the sense that we won't have codes that are effective uh, unless we have small enough numbers rather than everybody to monitor them. And second of all, unless the people who monitor them have sufficient professional or special expertise that they'll know whether they're really being violated. And once you have those two conditions, you're in the framework whereby you can create external or extraneous awards like the prize that you just referred to that you and Dennis have been working through. And that too will contribute to the psychological set of incentives that will make a code effective, unlike in a world where we are all fellow human beings with moral duties of respect to each other, and we have to all monitor everybody with equal degrees of expertise without any external sanction. We all care about good taxidermy, but I doubt if in this room we're the best framework in which to monitor the taxidermy profession, and we're better off at monitoring political philosophy or political theory. So if we add a sociology to all of this, wouldn't we then have a foundation for honor that would have it make some sense? Anthony? Um, how about yes? <laughs> Could I say no? Yes, absolutely. Now it's more interesting. But, I, I mean, we, yeah, we, 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 can, we can start debating the sociology, but I would think taxidermy, to use your, your example, works best when it's concerned not with pleasing its fellow taxidermists, but with creating uh, displays in the Natural History Museum that the public really benefits from. And I, I'm willing to make the sociological generalization on the basis of no evidence, but then again, to appeal to my professional identity, I'm not a sociologist, uh, that there's a kind of decadence or something like that that sets in when the honor world of a profession is limited quite strongly. I mean, this is all a matter of degree. Uh, when it's limited, the more strongly the honor world of a professional is limited to other members of that profession, um, the more likely it is that that profession will cease serving public goods. So you will get a decadent taxidermy uh, where... <laughs> 
where elaborate preservative techniques are used for their own sake, which only have the effect of making the giraffe look bizarre to members of the general public. We can make arguments about art or academia along these lines uh, if we are so inclined. And so, of course, this is all a matter of degree. Everyone can't monitor everyone equally well at all times. But I, I guess my concern was that maybe there needs to be a two-level honor world. The honor world internal to the profession, which is monitored quite closely by people outside the profession, who presumably, if the profession is justified, the profession in some way benefits. We can have a debate about whether a profession that is only good for other members of the profession can, for that reason, be morally justified. That's a very important moral debate. Uh, but whatever the moral purpose of a profession is, I think it's very important to have people outside that profession monitoring it to make sure it's providing the goods that it's really supposed to be providing, uh, rather than becoming an abstruse activity of a, of a decadent elite. Can I just say, though, that it, it, this, uh, that's, that seems right to me, but it, uh, that's why my account of professional honor had three parts, of which the third was a concern for the honor of the profession. That right. is, right. Uh, that is you've, you've got to connect the profession with, in the public mind with the purposes that it's supposed to be serving. Uh, and that's one of the breaks on kind of uh, the sort of... Um, the kind of aspect of professionalization that leads people to be sort of get better and better at doing the things that the profession has identified to itself as interesting, but which uh, turn out to serve no um, sort of general function, uh, don't contribute to the general function of the. Of, so this is a criticism that's made of the economics profession, right? That is to say, the economics profession is in part supposed to help us to understand and manage economies the internal standards have developed in such a way that what counts as a good contribution to economics is basically a mathematically interesting representation of a problem that economists are interested in. And if it turns out that uh, the, the development of the profession in that direction makes it unable to serve the public function, then people who have a concern for the honor of the profession have a reason to direct their attention inside the profession to reshaping its norms uh, to, to bring them back towards some public purpose. Yes. No, I'm going to ask. Thanks. Um, perhaps I misunderstand uh, some of this uh, debate, but uh, my inclination is to see an honor code as, uh, as um, a rough approximation to what uh, we might justify a profession as doing that is reasonably effective under certain conditions and leads us astray under others. And those are the kinds of conditions that Michael and Tim were referring to. Uh, so ultimately, the justification has to rest with moral arguments and not the appeal to the honor code itself. But, uh, and so the analogy here is to uh, sort of rules which might be approximations to effective behavior under a certain range of conditions. And a good honor code might be a way of enforcing professional standards under certain conditions, but uh, it'll lead us astray under a, a both some special circumstances that arise within it, and certainly under changing times when the barber surgeon uh, versus the surgeon is uh, uh, a change in the external world and the uh, kinds of justifications one would give. So my own sense is that the honor code is at best at some distance from normative justification of the roles. And um, it may have itself a justification under some circumstances, but it's only going to be an approximate uh, uh, approximation to what we want in the behaviors of uh, the professionals. Um, that wasn't the question. But well, to, well, to ask the question. No. Um, well, so uh, I agree uh, with the point about the normative. Well, two things. First, um, uh, uh, um, the honor 
while we, uh, our subjective experience, if we have a sense of honor, is that uh, the consider considerations of honor provide us with reasons for doing things. It's not, that is, uh, the, the fundamental background justifications for the institution are not what we experience in the phenomenology of our response to honor. What we experience is the sense, gentlemen don't lie. Now, um, and, uh, now, I think on the whole, it was a good thing, given that there were gentlemen, which was not a good thing, uh, <laughs> that one of the norms of governing gentlemen was that they should, shouldn't lie. In fact, that they should be well behaved, that they should, by the mid-19th century, one of the norms was that you should not cause harm to other people. That seems like a good norm to embody in an institution. But it, wasn't, it was associated with a form of hierarchy that was obviously, on moral grounds, uh, unacceptable. So I think there can be... Um, Two things that can be, a, a, yes, a, a wide distance, in the, especially in the phenomenology, in the experience of the agent, uh, between the, the underlying justification for the, the code taken as a whole, and it usually will be only taken as a whole that it has a justification. It won't be, the, the, the normative justification probably isn't going to work item by item. It's going to be the system that, uh, that is uh, defensible, if, if it's defensible at all. That'll be not visible, mostly, to the people. It'll be, they'll be responding to the demands of honor. This is important because one of the problems of honor, to go back to the problems of honor, has been historically uh, that because of the way it works as a system of subjective motivation, um, it very regularly uh, has led people to do things that um, in the circumstances were undoubtedly the morally wrong things to do, like dueling, foot binding, and... Uh, slavery and so on, uh, and, and honor killing. Um, and the, uh, if it were clear to the agent that the concern for honor were only appropriate uh, in the light of all the relevant background moral considerations, then of course you wouldn't engage in honor killing, right? Because you, could, you would see that it was not morally, a, a morally appropriate response to but once you've got an honor system up and running, the way it works as a system psychologically is that you find yourself motivated by the thought, I can't do that, it's dishonorable, or I must do this, it's the honorable thing to do. So that's why it's very important that the norms be morally <laughs> defensible, because if they aren't, people are going to do what's wrong, not just in the extreme cases, but a lot of the time, and that is the, exactly the problem with honor killing. This takes me back to where Okay. Melissa. Well, th first of all, thanks, thanks to everyone for a fantastically stimulating panel. My question, I think, does go to um, the work, actually not that the word honor is doing, but the, that the word code is doing. And I guess the question is fundamentally, um, and it goes to the question of the substantive justification of the content of the code in contrast to the social function that it's performing. Um, and so the question really is about the, the contrast between an honor code on the one hand and a code of ethics on the other hand. And in, in part the, the historical context of this, is we're seeing increasing shift toward the codification of professional ethics. And my own sense is that that actually is not such a great thing from a standpoint of the preservation of professions as experience, experienced as ethical communities. Um, but I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on the relationship between honor uh, and, and, uh, and, the, and the downside of the professionalization or the codification of professional ethics. Um, well, the, uh, so, I mean, there are a number of problems with the way in which uh, these ethical codes get, these ethical, professional ethics systems get uh, structured. One is that often they just contain what seem like the wrong rule. I mean, uh, because the people who develop them aren't necessarily, there's a halfway, you, know, you have to be, as it were, good at thinking about rules and good about thinking about what the profession does, and the, and the class of people who are have both of those qualities is quite small, and the process is often dominated mostly by people who understand what the profession does and who are not very good at thinking about rulemaking. But, um, 
But the other thing is that a large part of what is, uh, so maybe code is a bit of a distracting word here, but a large part of what's uh, involved in something like the, uh, the 18th century Gentleman League codes is not, uh, is, is, it's not codified. That is, I mean, there are rules about when you should duel, and those are actually written down. The, the, the Irish du duello is a list of 27 rules. Uh, but the, generally, the codes governing the behavior of gentlemen were not codified in those ways, and they, they were the sorts of things, they were like the sorts of things you learn when you become a doctor. You, you gradually learn what the, pat, what the appropriate patterns of deference are among people with different degrees of professionalization. Uh, you gradually uh, learn how to, how, what is thought to be the proper way of trading off considerations of uh, risk of harm against benefit and so on. You, you learn these things. And they're not internalized in a kind of, in a rule book. And while it's interesting to try and put them into rule books, and while I'm much in favor of things like, uh, of sort of checklists as a, as a technical device for uh, improving the, 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 the professional behavior, and I think they work, they seem good evidence they work well, as codes of ethics um, for the profession, I think they, uh, they miss the kind of intuitive, um, complex uh, si uh, situation respecting character of what you actually learn when you are inducted into, into an ethos. Tim? I, I took the word code from Anthony, but I agree entirely with his gloss on it. I, I used the expression special relations of trust and responsibility. So let's say um, being a stockbroker wouldn't be a profession in the sense being an investment advisor is something different. Put, puts, him, puts himself forward to stand in a certain relation of trust and responsibility to be guided by, and then it's, there, it, further norms may develop with understandings about which forms of conduct or which kinds of side, tr side trades or whatever are incompatible with that, uh, but they're really guided by some sense of what the, what, what, what the, what the structure of, of, of aims and interests is. So I, I wasn't necessarily speaking in terms of, of conversion converting everything into, into a list of do's and don'ts. Can I just have a, a really quick second round? Um, because my, my intuition is that... Not without a microphone. Oh, sorry. Hmm. Uh, my intuition is that what's happening with the proliferation of these ethics codes is analogous to the, the shift from common law to positivist, positive law. Uh, that writing, writing the principles down uh, is a way of, of providing them with some solidity, some stability, and some objective existence in, in public world. It also has the, the effect of potentially hollowing them out of their resonance with lived experience. But it also enables them to be subject to critical uh, evaluation from the standpoint of, of their justifiability. And um, now, we, we, we shift from common law to positive law under conditions of modernization. And so it's within that, that context that one worries, I guess, that, um, the, that the, the turn to codification or the turn to, to ethics codes is, uh, expresses uh, a, a, a dynamic within modernization. The, the, the term honor seems, yeah. The term honor seems to be uh, anachronistic in some ways. And so how do you, uh, how do you think about that? Um, well, the short answer to the term problem is that uh, I, one of the, I think, reasons why the term honor produces uh, um, some hostility uh, is that it is primarily associated in our minds with uh, forms of hierarchy that we rightly have rejected. So uh, I'd be happy to change the word, but I don't think you can give up the idea of a community defined in part about, by notions of what's worth respecting uh, and, and the concern for being worthy of the respect of other people who know what you're doing. I'm gonna call on Chris Korsgaard, but I just I feel compelled to just say, one of the things I really like about Anthony's work on honor is it forces us to think about reviving uh, not just the term, but the idea of honor within professions. And I can think of a lot of things in our profession that could do with more honoring. Really excellent teaching, re writing excellent letters of recommendation. I would love to be able to honor people who do. And I think there is an honor code 
among those of us who think about what's honorable about our profession that isn't rewarded in other ways. It's totally consistent, and it has to be, and I think Anthony would be, if not the first, the second after Tim to argue that it has to be grounded on ethics and justice. But I think, as Jenny and Michael point out, we have to come to terms with the psychology of how professions operate. And Michael, no matter how much you may want people who are not taxidermists or political theorists to be involved in monitoring the respective professions, it ain't going to happen. I mean, what political theorists do day in and day out and academics do is not going to be monitored by the general public. And if it were, be, be careful what you wish for. Um, it ought to serve the justice and ethics. So I just want to just get those of us who think day in and day out about the norms, norm of ethics and justice to broaden our understanding about how professions work well and finding, and I, that I do not just because this is a conference in honor of Dennis, but because he's devoted his career, finding institutional ways of doing what will enable professions to express honor to individuals because they serve the, the public wheel, but they serve it in a way that isn't transparent to the public would be a fabulous thing for us to think more about. Um, and I say that with my political theory hat on and also with my institutional hat of a president who wants our professions to do better in honoring people who, in ways that we can't just pay them for or can't just show the public. And that was my, I took a professional privilege there. <laughs> but Chris Korsgaard, please. Uh, thank you, Amy. Um, I'm more sympathetic, I think, to Anth the role Anthony wants to give honor than Tim is because my own way of thinking of morality makes honor-based thinking more continuous with moral thinking. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think you have to choose between Tim's two thoughts about why you mm -hmm. keep the promise because I think the thought about yourself that you can find dishonorable and unbearably so is the thought that you will let the other person mm -hmm. down. Um, I think that thought plays a role in transforming what's merely a reason into an obligation. Mm -hmm. Although when I put it that way, Tim thinks something very close to that, except that he would put the emphasis on the relationship in which you stand to the other rather than on the resulting self-conception. Um, having said all that, though, I'm going to ask a question that's, uh, that's on the other side of the question. Uh, years ago, when I was teaching at the University of Chicago, a group of businessmen gathered a bunch of local ethics professors together for dinner. And it turned out they wanted us to write them a code of professional ethics. And the reason they wanted <laughs> us to do this is because they thought if they could say they had such a code, it would be easier for them to resist external regulation. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. even when it's not quite so barefaced as that, <laughs> I do think it is a non-accidental feature of honor guided, of people guided by honor codes, coteries of people guided by, that they are distinctly resistant to external regulation. So it doesn't seem to me quite enough to say, yes, we have to have regulations too. And I just wondered if you had anything more to say on that, about that. Um, well, I mean, I agree with the problem. And, and, uh, but one of the reasons why um, they're harder to regulate, at least sometimes, is because professions properly guided by a conception of professional honor should need less regulation. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the argument they make against regulation. We're, we're already doing a pretty good job. Now, that's an, empiri that's an empirical claim. That, is, it, is it or is it not the case that the way in which uh, um, stockbrokers uh, relate to their clients uh, is currently well designed to advance the interests of the client that they advertise themselves of advancing? That's a, that's a and could, we do, could they do better? Well, um, I would say the first place to look for possible ways of doing better is to ask them. They know what they're doing and the, the, they understand the, the task, but it certainly shouldn't be left up to them. And if we think that public regulation is useful in order to kick up a baseline of, of various sorts, I'm completely in favor of that. And in a way, that's like your, 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 the answer you, as it were, you gave me to, <laughs> to Tim, which is uh, I am not against... Uh, uh, I think that someone who, um, who doesn't lie 
because it's wrong, and also because um, she doesn't want to be the kind of person who does wrongs of that kind. The, the wrongness of it plays an in, internal role in explaining what the, func what the honor judgment is. So it's, it's not in that sense independent of the, uh, the this, this psychological mechanism isn't independent of the, the normative content. So, but, so, so what I want to say is um, uh, I, we need law, we need the economy, and we need, and we need uh, honor systems, all of them as forms of social regulation. Uh, and of course, in all of them, everybody needs to be guided by morality as well, which is not a system of social regulation exactly, but a different, but nevertheless, the fundamental source of normative demands. In so far, in, can I, can I yes, say? And I'll take the last th three sentences. In, in so far as the thought, now, gentlemen don't go back on their word or whatever, just is the thought, I owe it to the promisee, then we have what I call transparency and I'm ha completely happy with it. Uh, but it does seem to me that my, I tried to bring out anything that they can come apart. It was insofar as they come apart that I thought that there was, that there was a problem. John, last question. Yeah, my question is really partially for Tim and partially for Anthony, which is, is this on? Yeah, you can just hear me. hold okay. it close. Uh, I just, uh, your example of the angry officer corps was an interesting example for me because I mean here, the value of the angry officer corps was exactly that they had something to resist, <laughs> you know, what the White House or the or was doing, right? That they had some sense of what norms ought to be applied, and they were, you know, defined, self-defined, right? So, so to say, so first of all, that seems like a phenomenon, and then secondly, to say, as has been said several times, that there ought to be regulation is problematic here, because. You, you risk losing what they have that's distinctive and powerful and exactly when you need them. That is to say, they, they presumably, on your account, you know, are in a position to resist something that you know, is arguably very wrong. No one else is in that position. If they were regulable in the normal way of regulating, that could be subverted. So I'm just wondering how you think about it. I mean, it seems like there's something valuable there that I, would I think could be lost if we're, if we're gonna try to reduce it away. <laughs> So first, Tim, and then Anthony, you have the last word. Well, they were building a lot into the example by assuming that they're right. Therefore, we don't want anybody interfering with them. And the officer corps might have had some crazy idea about shooting prisoners of war or something. I mean, so we're building something in there. Uh, so in that case, I think outside regulation would be wrong. But I, I took it from my experience there um, that, that the officer corps was trying to inculcate these standards in the these young, young persons whom they were sending out there onto the field of battle by trying to get them to appreciate what, what was important about, about that kind of conduct. And, uh, so, and so the honor came on top of that, but, but it came via this, this teaching. That was clear from the classes that I sat in on, as well as from their reaction to this outside thing. That was the point that I was trying to, to make. Whether outside regulation would be good or bad, of course, is going to vary from case to case depending on how you, how you set it up. But your point is that there are cases where outside regulation would be counterproductive if an honor system is already doing its work. And that point I completely agree with. Just uh, I was invited to talk to the joint meeting, which happens every year, of the honor boards of all the military academies. So these were the young people who administer the honor system, uh, the honor systems of the Air Force Academy and uh, West Point and so on. And one of the... Uh, these were... I, I mean, I don't know... They were clearly a non-random sample of, 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 the, of that population, but still, one interesting thing about them, I thought, was that it had never occurred to them that um, honor could demand them to do something that was inconsistent with morality. Uh, they really did have a highly moralized sense of, I don't mean that they, mm -hmm. that is, they thought, if it's wrong, it can't be honorable, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a good thing. I mean, I don't think it's correct. Uh, that is, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but it's a good thing that they, that they uh, think it. On that note, please join me in thanking the panelists and Anthony for this. Thank you.